enthusiastic. Um, Canaan has a couple of enduring mysteries uh, uh, that lurk in the back of people's minds and they question why such and such happened. Among them, of course, is the, the continuing uh, perplexity about why we had Sodom and Gomorrah. Um, there is no answer to that one <clears throat> that I've ever found. I found a couple of theories which to me seem rather far-fetched, but the other one uh, that people sometimes wonder about is why the one king became two. And in looking into it, um, it seems that the answer is not all that difficult um, to explain. It's geographic rather than anything else that I've been able to uncover. Although as I give this talk, you're going to hear one tantalizing phrase, and no one knows what it, no one today knows what it means. But apparently, people in 1850 did. So to start the tale of two Canaans, um, the decisive moment was uh, June 28, 1858, when townspeople living in the northern section of the historic town of Canaan held a momentous meeting. They gathered at a hotel operated by Ichabod Stevens to hold the first town meeting in what would henceforth be known as the town of North Canaan. They were tasked with electing new lenders, uh, leaders of, for an embryonic community created by an act of legislature only the month before. Ike Stevens uh, was a, a major businessman in town, and he operated a hotel in the growing village of North Canaan, just about opposite the intersection of Main and Railroad Streets, because most of us are of a certain age will, will recognize that uh, location as, as being the former Bianchi store, or um, earlier than that, Hearts. And even before that, if we have anyone who's really old, uh, the First National. So this was a long rambling building. It sat right across uh, from the, uh, the intersection. And um, it uh, had grown up in the center of town after the uh, Houstonic Railroad chugged into town in 1841. Um, the railroad brought a, a segment of population to the community that um, was hard working, hard drinking, hard partying. Um, they were known in the local newspaper as the plug uglies. <laughs> and they liked to gather at Stevens on weekends um, where they would rapidly spend their pay on the dances at the hotel and drinking. They were raucous affairs that irritated and offended local townspeople. And uh, Eventually, Ike Stevens Hotel was purchased by some of the deacons of the church and torn down. But in June 1858, it was put to a much more sober use. The original town hall, located at the lower corners, and we are uh, at the lower corners as we sit here. Um, the uh, drive that we come up to Gear Village, that's down at the base of that is where the town hall was. So initially the municipal offices were located, oh, about a couple of hundred yards from here. And uh, they did not use that for uh, town meetings. It was a compromised placement as a central point for municipal business. But that placement was uh, emblematic of, of the problem that ultimately led to the division of the town. It was too distant from both north and south sections of the town to be really convenient. The original town encompassed some 52.8 uh, acres, or square miles, excuse me, and for the first 120 years of its existence, the town bordered Salisbury along the Housatonic River, Cornwall on the south, Massachusetts on the north and Norfolk on the east, but a wedge-shaped range of mountains running east to west cut the town virtually in two. The town hall, the old town hall, nestled beneath the western tip of Canaan Mountain and was the first point 
that did not necessitate an arduous trip over the mountains to travel north or south. The tale of uh, the two Canaans actually um, begins with the tale of one Canaan. The town had its inception when, at one o'clock on a cold Tuesday in January 1738, Samuel Lind, John Griswold, and John Richards gathered at the New London Courthouse to sell one of the five new townships laid out in the largely unoccupied western lands of Connecticut. They had been charged by the General Assembly of the colony to sell the northwest town, bounded west by the Usatonic River, uh, continuing the sale, quote, by adjournment as aforesaid till the whole be sold. The land was to be disposed of, quote, to the highest bidder at the minimum cost of uh, 60 pounds per right. Each of the 50 rights, the first 50 rights, um, were sold, uh, sold were to be of equal quality and quantity and to comprise at least 30 acres. Land in the town that would become Canaan sold briskly and at a higher price than in other towns put up for sale that winter. The future Kent and Cornwall <coughs> sold for a minimum of $50, or, uh, 50 pounds of right for instance, in Salisbury, which in the 20th and 21st centuries would eclipse Cain in the real estate market, went on the block for only 30 pounds per share. Norfolk, today a desirable rural retreat for the wealthy, was difficult to sell at all in the 18th century, and all but one <coughs> bidder demanded the return of his money after viewing the land. 20 years were required to sell the first 50 shares in that town. The sale of the townships had been several years in the coming. The General Assembly had pondered the future of the western lands before, but it was not until the boundary dispute with New York was settled in 1731 that it established the first of several committees to, look, uh, to report on the viability of selling the land. The first committee reported on June 1, 1731, that surveyors should be sent to lay out five towns and, quote, report their doings herein to this assembly in October next with their opinion of the goodness or barrenness of the lands of the said townships. It was just what the assembly had hoped to hear. Following the survey, a second committee reported in 1732 that the money from the sale should be allocated to existing towns, New London in the case of Canaan, to support the schools in those uh, towns. Canaan, with its broad fertile valleys, swift with uh, water courses and its great falls, was instantly attractive to buyers and several sales were recorded on January 4th, the very first day, and then in the days thereafter. The first to lay his money on the line was Daniel Lawrence of Plainfield. He was the older brother of Isaac Lawrence who would become a major land holder in the town. On February 22, the proprietors met in Weathersfield and a committee was named to lay out the parcels and highways of the fledgling town. The purchasers were then to draw lots for the parcels so that all favoritism would be avoided. But the settler, when the settlers arrived, there was much selling and buying of lots as the new residents jockeyed for the parcels they really wanted and many of them, some of them, I should say not many, were mere speculators who quickly sold their land uh, for good profit. During the organizational meeting, the proprietors decided to call their new town Canaan, a name confirmed by the legislature in 1739. I have not found any uh, reason why they chose that name. Uh, it's kind of consistent with English naming patterns, but I, I don't know for sure why they chose the name. None of them seemed to come from a town named Canaan, which was the usual source. The first proprietors began to trickle into the virgin forests only five months after the sale in New London, but they were not the first people to live in the area. The Scaticoke and uh, Mohican Indians had a large village on the Salisbury side of the Housatonic River near Dutcher's Bridge and the eastern side of the river, they used the eastern side of the river for summer camps and hunting. Six Dutch families had been in residence for more than a decade 
establishing their homes near Dutcher's Bridge and along Route 1 to 26 to the Point of Rocks. Interactions with the local Native Americans was largely civil, and there are no verified instances of violence between the Indians of Northwest Connecticut and the Dutch and English who made their way into the region. Indeed, in 1735, friendly Indians encamped around a spring on what was to become Route 126, vacated one of their wigwams so Nathaniel Dean and his family could use it while the Englishman built his house. The Connecticut legislature required that Indians be compensated for the, their land, and in some ways, the Dutch settlers fared worse than their native neighbors, being required to relinquish their Indian deeds and losing a portion of their holdings when the town was sold in New London. It seems somehow unjust to me that the new proprietors held their first meeting in the home of Peter Huggabone, right down near the Point of Rocks, while at the same time voting that Huggabone and his neighbor, Abram Ham Hollenbeck, should retain only about 15 acres of their much larger holdings. It's hard to read, um, it's hard to say with any accuracy what what happened, but I have a suspicion Huggaboom was pretty angry about this because shortly after, within days after making that decision, they met again and they granted him more of his land back. So I think he may have had some harsh words to share with his new neighbors about taking his land. After lots were drawn to determine ownership, the way was clear for the settlement to begin. The diary of Nathaniel Stevens records that Samuel Bryant of Stamford was the first to arrive in May 1738, followed almost immediately by the Lawrence families who arrived on June 2nd after 11 days of travel from Plainfield, Connecticut. Ironically, considering the next 120 years of Canaan history, the very first settlers located around what would become North Canaan Town Center Samuel Bryant settled on his portion on the Blackberry River at the base of Honey Hill, and Isaac Lawrence found his par parcel farther east on the Blackberry, literally digging in as he established a rudimentary shelter in the side of Church Terrace. In 1751, he was billed his third and final home, the stately Lawrence Tavern, on what would later become Route 7. The current village of North Canaan did not attract many residents, however, and even some of those who came did not stay there long. Bryant seems to have pulled up stakes, or at least did not leave much of an imprint on the town's history. Former Connecticut Western editor John <coughs> Romeyer notes in his Scrapbook of North Canaan, published around the turn of the last century, that the tide of immigration that set in after this first attachment seems to have diverted in the directions of East Canaan and South Canaan, and for many years, <clears throat> the village was to a great extent shunned by new arrivals. He refers to an old map, then in the possession of N.S. Stevens of East Canaan, purportedly drawn in the very early 1800s that showed a heavy, <clears throat> heavy population center in East Canaan, but with barely half a dozen farmhouses in the northwest corner of the town. Uh, those of you who heard me talk last time may remember that I showed you a map that showed all of the development out in East Canaan, but with almost nothing in the village center. This information is corroborated by looking at the highly detailed maps published in 53, which shows many homes and industries clustered along the Blackberry and East Canaan. The 1850 map published just five years before the formal division of the town and 12 years after the arrival of rail service, does show other population centers, however. Canaan villages started to grow around the depot. There was an enclave in Huntsville in the southwest corner of the town around the, uh, around the Great Falls where water power promoted a plethora of industrial uses. And at South Canaan where a store and a number of residences clustered around the meeting house. The rest of the town was pretty much empty. This population distribution helps to explain the ultimate division of the town. The early settlers were, of necessity, agriculturalists.
but they were also entrepreneurs and early industrialists, and they largely settled, settled where the driving force of their world, water, could be found. The streams that powered their world, the Housatonic running north and south, the Blackberry in the northern portion of town, and the Hollenbeck in the south, dictated the distribution of residences and businesses. Dividing these population centers were steep mountains. <clears throat> in their earliest years, when resources and people were scarce, the settlers tried to find the most central locations for their built municipal buildings. In the apparent interest of fairness, the General Assembly appointed a committee of three men from Salisbury, Kent, and Sharon to find an equitable location for the first meeting house. In May 1740, they settled on a spot along Six Rod Road, today Sand Road, and recommended that the first meeting house be built on the western side of the road, just north of, current, uh, of the current Sand Road Animal Hospital. You can identify it if any of you feel ambitious by walking out. There's a, a steep hill that comes down just th this side of Dr. Dave's and it, it evens out and there's a rock out there that's got a split in it and it's called Saddle Rock and that purportedly is where the women used to climb up on the horse pillions to go home. <clears throat> so that kind of marks where, they, where it was. That spot was not popular for some reason and the building was later picked up and moved to look a location near the Point of Rocks, a little less than a mile farther south. And this spot, for those of you who are going down towards Falls Village, uh, just before you get to the Point of Rock, there's an old house on the right, and it was just in that vicinity. While, that's <clears throat> while that spot was equidistant for settlers living along the Norfolk border in the north and Huntsville residents in the south, there was still a long, long way to go for worship services on horseback in the dead of winter. By 1767, the first practical division of the town came when the legislature approved the formation of a second ecclesiastical district in the north. A meeting house was constructed at the base of Trescott Hill in East Canaan and served for more than 50 years before it was dismantled and its materials reused in the current East Canaan Congregational Church. <clears throat> and this may have been one of the earliest uh, uh, construction disputes in the town because uh, they gave them an unreasonably short period of time to build the East Canaan Church and 20 years later they had to rebuild these came to church, so things were kind of falling apart in 20 years. Those in the South fared better when in 1804 the congregation and the First Society settled into the South Canaan Meeting House, so that was, that was the uh, first really fine meeting house in the area. The one in, on Trescott Hill was a very, very plain building and very uncomfortable. That ecclesiastical division eased the burden of the faithful, and everyone was pretty much required to be faithful in those days when church and state were one. But it did little for the conduct of municipal life. The first town hall, as noted previously, was uh, located at the point of Canaan Mountain near the intersection of Route 7 and Sand Road. But for practical reasons, town meetings continued to be held on an alternating basis in the north and south sections of town. At virtually the same time that the legislature approved the ecclesiastical division of the community, the townspeople voted that, quote, the freemen's meeting and town meetings shall be in the manner following these, the first to be at the meeting house in the first society and the second to be at the meeting house in the second society and so to change every other time from the one end of the town to the other. Tax collectors were elected to serve independently in the north and the south, and in some instances, town records speak of two men being chosen, one from each section, to handle school and parsonage funds. Even land records began to refer to the first or second ecclesiastical societies. The Douglas Library, established in 1823 through a request from William Douglas, 
a book-loving bachelor who died in 1821, was located in the original town hall and provided an intractable problem, more of an intractable problem than town meetings. The will stipulated that the uh, library be near the Douglas homestead, <clears throat> and that, that house is the one that's on the left as you go into the Canaan Country Club, the Hitchcock family owns it. Um, Douglas's brother, who lived virtually next door to the town hall, might not have thought that that location was too inconvenient, but it was an attitude not shared by many other users. Only seven years later, attorney Samuel, Samuel Church of Salisbury was asked for his opinion about the legality of dividing the library, presumably to make the collection more available to those in the north and south. He decreed the will stipulated one library for the whole of the town and that it could not be divided. As we shall see, the library would be a central issue when the town finally did separate. Nearly 50 years ago, the late Nellie Rogers, Falls Village town clerk, traced the evolution of the division by perusing town meeting records. She discovered that, quote, the division was not entirely strange to the minds of the voting inhabitants of Canaan when they first began political action in 1810. So 60 years after we were settled, they were talking about dividing us. But if anyone wants uh, proof the change is hard, it can be found in the stuttering movement Canaan made towards division. The obvious inconveniences associated with the town's geography impelled some towards change, but others, perhaps more traditional, clung to the historic town. It would be wonderful if there were newspapers, letters, or diaries of the day that gave insight into the thinking of the town's citizens, but only the bare municipal record remains. That re <coughs> record began on April 23, 1810, with a spare announcement in town meeting minutes voted to prefer a petition to the General Assembly of their session in May next to divide and incorporate said town of Canaan into two towns. The clerk made no mention of who was to prepare the petition and how it was to be presented. If a petition was presented, it was not approved, as no reference uh, to it is found in later minutes, according to Ms. Rogers' research. Six years of silence followed until November 4, 1816, when a more detailed resolution was passed that named Nathaniel Stevens, Benedict Douglas, and Ovid Plum to present a petition to the General Assembly and to, quote, take any measures to carry uh, the same into effect, let's go. Since the Assembly would not meet for another six months, there was plenty of time to, uh, for the committee to work out the details. They needn't have bothered. The seesaw tipped the other direction by January 20th, 1817, and Canaan wrote, residents voted to repeal the November 1 vote. The subject may still have been on the mind of residents, but the official record is mum without any activity for the next seven years. In March 1823, another attempt was made that showed that Canaan was already divided, if only in opinion. The official record reads, one, voted to divide the town of Canaan into two separate towns. Two, voted to reconsider the vote to divide and not divide the town. Three, voted to dissolve the meeting. <laughs> I've been to one or two meetings like that over the years. That convulsion of indecision was apparently enough to dissuade further attempts for another nine years. But in April 1832, the topic surfaces again on a town meeting call. The vote, which was recorded in detail by the clerk, gives a clear glimpse of the continuing resistance to the idea. 45 men, remember women could not vote at that time, supported the proposal while 90 op um, opposed it. The sheer number of people voting suggests one of two things. Either town meetings were more popular in the 19th century than today, or feelings were running very high. Proponents let the matter lie for another nine years, and when it came back before a town meeting, it appeared that some citizens had taken it upon themselves to petition the General Assembly. 
the April 1841 meeting calls uh, call asks if quote the town will defend a petition preferred to the General Assembly for a division of the said town by Edmund Dunning and others and if so to appoint an agent to cut, conduct such a defense. Despite Dunning's efforts that time had not yet come and the issue was defeated by a vote of 70 to 167. Instead, William Burrell was dispatched to Hartford to oppose the petition. Eight years and one day later, another meeting was held at the home of Colonel M.C. Peck and dwelt solely on the, division, uh, the issue of partition. Again, some residents had privately petitioned for the change. The town meeting call was a little vague, but the results were not. The calls read, first choose a moderator for said meeting, second to see if the town will vote to appoint an agent to oppose the petition of Harvey Lawrence and others to the General Assembly of the state for the division of the town of Canaan into two towns, or to see if the town will appoint an agent to attend to said petition in behalf of said town of Canaan. The results of the meeting showed that the townspeople voted not to oppose the petition, a stunning softening of earlier votes, but having dealt with the first part of the two-part question, they failed to appoint anyone to support the petition either. That did not settle the issue. Having decided on May 5 uh, to defend, uh, ni neither to defend or oppose the Lawrence petition, a call was issued the same day for another town meeting to be held May 12th to vote on the very same question. This time, opposition forces held sway, and on May 12th, an agent was appointed to oppose the, petition, uh, the division. There's an uncanny rhythm to these repeated attempts at division, and one has to wonder why petitions resurfaced at eight and nine year intervals. At any rate, it would be another nine years before the issue again came before the town, and this time the preceding 48 years of wiffle waffling would be swept away with decisive action. The committee decided on May 3, 1858, to support an independent pet petition sent to the General Assembly by Daniel Pierce and others, and to appoint a committee of six to establish a dividing line between the soon-to-be two towns. The committee itself divided into northern and southern <coughs> factions and prepared separate recommendations to bring back to the town by May 10. This was truly astonishing speed after almost five decades of indecision. The two reports submitted were similar. The first noted that the town would, quote, naturally, uh, was naturally divided from the uh, east line nearly to the west by an impassable mountain thus making two distinct communities with little intercourse and but few interests in common. And here comes the, the tantalizing phrase, and that, quote, for these and other reasons known to all, what could they have been? A fair and equitable division would benefit both sections. I'd love to know what everybody knew. Both reports suggested, <coughs> suggested boundary lines that roughly followed the ecclesiastical districts, a straight line that stretched uh, from 50 rods below Dutcher's Bridge easterly to the Norfolk Town Line. They both recommended the division of jointly held property and monies that roads and bridges within town boundaries would be maintained by the new municipal entities, with the exception of the uh, bridge over the Housatonic River at Falls Village, for which North Canaan would be assessed a fair proportion, and that all poppies would be cared for with, by the town in which they resided, apparently yielding to the immutability of Doug Douglas's will, the towns would have joint ownership of the library. There was only one significant difference between the two reports, and herein lies a continuing problem. The first, prepared by the men who lived in the southern part of town, left a blank where the name of the new town would be inserted. The report by the northern faction included the name of North Canaan. When that slightly more detailed report was favored by voters, 150 years of name confusion was put in motion and continues today. Few who were unfamiliar with the town are ever comfortable with the local nomenclature and postal designations 
of the town of Canaan is Falls Village and the town of North Canaan is Canaan. If the town continues thus for 250 years, it is unlikely the state will ever figure it out. <laughs> the second report also suggested, perhaps because it was drafted by men who would soon live in North Canaan, that the jointly owned library, quote, be kept at some place as near its present location as suitable uh, can, be, can conveniently be obtained for it. <laughs> they, were, they were asleep on the job, believe me. The General Assembly acted with dispatch following the town meeting vote and approved the division on May 28th. As previously noted, North Canaan held its organizational meeting in Stevens Hotel on June 28th, while Canaan, needing to reorganize, met in Brewster Hall on June 14th. The ball was well and truly in play, and by the first Monday of September, censuses had been taken by both communities and the selectmen had agreed on the division of funds and properties, support for paupers, and North Canaan's payment for the Housatonic Bridge. The agreements for support of paupers showed the townspeople to be well situated with only three persons in Falls Village needing town support and two in Canaan, that's a very low percentage. There were a lot of little things to think about in dividing the towns. The May session of the uh, General Assembly de decreed that Falls Village had to pay Canaan for its share of the, quote, standard set of weights and measures belonging to the old town of Canaan, and issued a detailed list of assets and liabilities to be divided between the communities. Even with that agreement, there were loose ends. In 1862, a committee was formed to, quote, settle matters and accounts between said town of Canaan and North Canaan, and to suggest such proceedings in regard to the unsettled matter of the town as they shall uh, deem meet and proper. The division between the towns had lopped off the northern end of the uh, old town's eighth school district, and that area became part of the second school district in North Canaan. As late as 1879, a town meeting was fussing over its exact boundary, and in 1889, the Falls Village selectmen worked a sharp deal with the town of North Canaan getting the newer municipality to pay more than its share for buying the early town books. The Douglas Library was the last item of business for the two towns, when in 1889 Falls Village received a generous bequest from wealthy Ann Hunt to aid in the construction of the D.M. Hunt Library, a committee was appointed to consider the disposition of the Douglas Library, still located in North Canaan, but since 1858 in the new town hall on Granite Avenue. The committee's report recommended that Falls Village sell out its interest in the old library for a very reasonable $75. The money was received on November 7, 1890, just 80 years after the subject of, of division was first approached. So it takes us a while to do things around here. <laughs> I'll answer any questions that I can if anyone has any. Uh, why did the, the auction of the towns take place in New London? Um, at the time, the General Assembly uh, sold undeveloped lands to support schools. In the beginning, they, they sold most of them to support Yale and uh, College Hill. East Canaan was uh, a very early land grant, a 999-year lease, and I haven't been able to find out to whom, but it was a, a lease that would last a very long time and would support Yale College. In this instance, they had some developing towns and they decided that once they had the boundaries set up out here in 1731, they would consider selling this undeveloped land and they would uh, use the money to support uh, different cities, that schooling in different cities. In our instance, we supported New London, but other t other towns were sold in New Haven and other communities. There were five towns sold at that time. No insight into why in the 1850s that suddenly there was a change of attitude or change of heart? I, I don't know. I, I really don't know. It's just, uh, 
It was known to all. <laughs> they, maybe they had just talked the issue to death. Maybe enough time had gone by so that uh, the uh, cohesiveness of the two communities had had worn out to a, a large degree. It, it's almost counterintuitive because uh, uh, transportation was getting easier. They had actual roads. They had a railroad that would get you from uh, Falls Village to Canaan, Lickety Split. So I'm not quite sure why. I, I can only I can only think that it was the uh, the line in there that said we have very few common interests. We don't go to church together. We don't have schools together. You know, time to say goodbye. And there's that tantalizing reason, line of, and for reasons that everyone knows. <laughs> Not that I've encountered. In fact, uh, as I've been going uh, through papers from the 19th century and in the instance of the Adam family papers, uh, um, people had their differences, but I'm not picking up on real animosity. The, uh, the issue is almost always centered around business or something like that. And the families were incredibly integrated through all the towns. I mean, you, you cross the town border, you're running into the same names and the same families. So I'm not, I'm not finding that as I look at primary documents. Not that I know of. I mean, the iron industry spanned both towns and was owned by the same families. So, you know, that wouldn't have, that wouldn't have been it. And the rest of the folks tended to be just uh, storekeepers and farmers. And, you know, I, I don't know, I have not picked up anything other than the fact that it was just really, really hard to do business. You either crossed Canaan Mountain, which is not easy, or you came all the way down and around. And you got to remember that for all 12 years of that, there was nothing down here except the municipal building. Can you speak about the impact of the uh, railroad? Um, well, I don't think I don't, I don't think the people that lived in the northern uh, ecclesiastical district had any particular um, strong affiliation with the businesses down around the Great Fall. They there were more uh, centers of business out in East Canaan, which would have attracted them, and uh, we didn't get the east-west line until years after the division. So. I don't think that had any effect. And by the 1850s, people were moving quite happily along the rails to get to where they wanted to be north and south. So I don't, that's where I, why it's kind of counterintuitive that it, it finally reached uh, its conclusion after transportation became easier. But you still, you still had a long stretch of drive from Norfolk, that, in that area, all the way down what was then known as Meeting House Road to get to uh, to the polling place or to the militia drills or uh, and even longer to go to the church until 1804, 18 excuse me 1796 because that's when they they settled the new ecclesiastical district. So for people in, in Huntsville and uh, and uh, the eastern portions of this town. It was just inconvenient, and I think that's the bottom line. The history of slavery in town? Yes, absolutely. We had, uh, in fact, <laughs> in fact, a, an interesting little aside. I, I just got a, a packet of books that were put out in uh, 1938 during the Turf Centenary, and uh, they're really marvelous books. And one is on slavery. These were meant for schools. And there, there's one on roads. There's uh, one on churches. There's one on uh, the boundaries of Connecticut and the, the disputes with the other colonies. And uh, there's a few guides for teachers. 
The one book that appears not ever to have been opened or used is the one on slavery in Connecticut. I don't think it, it fit our image in 1938 to think of ourselves as a slave state, but we had, uh, slavery did not become illegal in Connecticut until 1848, and a lot of the older slaves um, were kept in bondage um, while the younger people were allowed to go with between the ages of 21 and 25, depending on how their owners negotiated that deal. Um, so we had, and we had a, a case, a rather famous case in the area of the Mars family, who were owned by the East Canaan Congregational Church minister. And um, they escaped, they, he was married to a Virginia woman and she wanted to go home. So he was about to tap, pack up and go home and take all these people with him to a much more um, serious kind of bondage. And they ran away to Norfolk. And they, uh, they were hidden by abolitionists for quite a long time while there were parties all over the place looking for them. <clears throat> and this doesn't speak too well of our congregational ministers. <laughs> But it was the Congregational Minister of Norfolk that ratted them out and told them where to find them. So then they, did, they worked out a deal where the, um, the parents would continue in bondage if they would, no, the parents were allowed to go if their sons, their two oldest sons, were um, kept as slaves until they were 21. So we, we very much had slavery. It was in some way, some ways a more paternalistic kind of slavery. They, they frequently ate at the same table with their owner. They worked in the fields. Um, there wasn't as much evidence of flogging and all of that sort of thing. But we were not, Connecticut was known as the worst of the northern slave states, had the most slaves within its boundaries. And our good friend Isaac Lawrence, who we all look to as a, um, as a founder of Canaan, at one point was reported to have had 20. So he was in the top 1% of slaveholders in the state. Anyone else? Anything I might know? <laughs> Thank you.